ahead. So in 2006, Joe Ryan walked outside to check his mail. As he was flipping through it, he noticed a letter from the Littleton Adventist Hospital, and he found that a little odd because he hadn't been to the hospital in a long time. And when he opened up the letter, he was incredulous because he had just received a bill for $44,000 for a colon surgery. Well, Joe was sure that there was some kind of a mistake. So when he called the hospital to dispute the bill and talked with accounts payable, they were insistent that Joe was the responsible individual and that he was responsible for the bill. Well, Joe was undeterred. He decided he was going to march down to that hospital and prove to them that he physically had not had that operation by lifting up his shirt and showing them he had no scars from a colon surgery. But it wasn't until he went through a mountain of red tape and a lot of bureaucracy before the hospital finally acquiesced and agreed to take the loss on the medical bill. But unfortunately, Joe's credit was ruined. He had for financial foreclosure on his home and he almost lost his business. And to this day, Joe's medical record is still not correct. Well, how did this happen? A few more months before the dispute, Joe had decided he was going to place a magazine ad for his business. And when he called the magazine, he was connected to a salesman who, unbeknownst to Joe, was a career criminal out on parole. And he was the one who needed the surgery. And he successfully social engineered Joe into revealing his social security number and his date of birth. We all know this is a very common form of vishing. And the salesperson said, it's just routine. Unfortunately, Joe's story is not unique. Medical identity theft is fast on the rise. Can anyone tell me how much, and I'll tell you why, can anyone tell me how much a credit card goes for on the dark web? Does anyone have an answer for that? No, it's actually less than that. If you have a credit card and the CVV code, you might be lucky to get $30. How much do you get from a full medical record? Anyone have a guess? Yes, it's about $1,000 if you have a full medical record. Medical identity theft has happened to 27 million Americans. It's one in 13 patients, or roughly 10% of the U.S. population. The financial impact that this can have on a healthcare organization it can be devastating. For just one breach of a medical record, it's $380. And we all know that it's usually thousands, if not millions, of records that get breached. So the average cost to a healthcare organization that suffers a breach is around $4 million. So we all know that it's important to protect data and how vulnerable it is. We also know that humans are usually the weakest link, and it's usually through human error that a breach occurs. So now that we all understand how important it is to, or why it's so important to protect data, I'm going to tell you how to protect data from a security awareness perspective. But before I do, I should tell you who I am. So my name is Paige Ishii, and I have worked for Intermount Healthcare for the last 18 years. I worked in IT operations for 17 years. I was hired as a night operator. I ran kill jobs, and I did a real estate reports in the I-series. I transitioned over to day, and then I was asked to do provisioning. I also project managed our server conversion from console one over to Active Directory. I, after that, I quickly became a subject matter expert on our provisioning process. I was asked to join our role-based access controls committee. And after a few years of doing that, I was asked to co-chair the committee. In 2014, we decided to go live with a electronic medical record, which is an EMR. And I was asked to help with the implementation of that as well. Last year, I decided to transition over to cybersecurity, and I was put in charge of our cybersecurity awareness program. So the reason I'm here talking with you today is hopefully to teach you or to help you learn the valuable lessons that I learned and help and save you the time, pain, and agony that I went through on trying to figure out how to do this. So I also have done a lot of volunteering. I've volunteered with ISACA, which is the information Systems Access and Controls Association. I was their director of education for a while. I've done some volunteering here at um, the local security conferences, St. Con, HackWest, and B-Sides. 
So how many licks does it take to get to the center of a good security awareness program? Well, remember the old Tootsie Pop commercial? How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Pop? The world may never know. Well, I'm going to tell you today how many licks it takes to get to the center of a good security awareness program. There are five. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go through each one of these steps. You, it, and you're going to start with your human survey. You're going to have your compliance base. You're going to go through growth, behavior change, long-term sustainment, and then finally you're going to want to have some metrics in play. But what if you're the only guy at your organization doing cybersecurity, or even IT for that matter? Can you do a security awareness program? Well, I'm here to tell you that yes, yes you can. It may take a little bit more effort, and you may not be able to fully roll out a full cybersecurity or so awareness program, but you can still be successful, and I'm going to have some quick and dirty tips for you at the end. So before we actually get into the different stages, I want to take my own human survey. How many of you have a security awareness by show of hands? Do you have uh, responsibilities for that, or do you have a full program? If you have a full program, keep your hand up. Okay. So what industries do you work for? If you, do you work in healthcare? Anyone work in healthcare? We have my teams here. Thanks for coming, guys. Um, what about government? Do you work for the government? What about finance? Anybody in finance? How about education? Private sector? Is there any industry that I missed? Okay, so this program is very industry agnostic. So if you have a program in place or you want to get a program up and running, then this can work for your organization as well. So stage one is our human survey. But before we begin with the human survey, I want to make sure that I mention you need to have executive buy-in in order for this to be successful at your organization. Without executive buy-in, you're not going to have visibility to your program, and you're probably not going to have much of a budget. So you really need to get someone from your C-suite involved. And that can be your chief executive officer, your chief financial officer, your chief compliance officer, your president, or the owner of your company. And you will, the way to get them involved is going to be by showing them how much it would cost if you were breached versus how much it's going to cost for you to spend some time and effort on security awareness. Now, the second thing that you're going to want to do is you're going to want to do a human survey. And you want to find out where your users are at. Now, the one easy way to do that is by launching your own phishing campaign. And um, that's where you go out and you send out emails to people, have them click on a link, and you find out exactly who knows about phishing emails and who doesn't. Um, another thing you could do is just send out a survey and, and do a general survey and ask people. So I wanted to share a story with you. I was um, at another security conference and I had a phishing, or I'm sorry, I had a buddy who was wearing a phishing shirt. It had some kind of a clip about P-H-I-S-H -H on it. And he was walking down the hallway and someone stopped him and said, hey, you spelled fish wrong. Well, we don't want our users to be those people. We want our users to be able to identify what a phishing email looks like. We want them to be uh, uh, reporting those. We want them to be uh, calling into the help desk or uh, to our cybersecurity department saying, hey, I think I have a phishing email. And we want them to be able to fully identify what those look like. OK, so the second thing you're going to want to look at is your compliance. We all are in. A lot of us are in cybersecurity because of the regulatory requirements. Yes, there's regulatory requirements for everything. So I've compiled a list of regulatory requirements per industry. A lot of these, I, I'm sure I've probably missed a couple of them, but I've done my best to compile most of these. Now, if you're doing security awareness, you're going to want to have these readily available because at some point while you're doing the awareness, someone's going to ask you for those. And if you don't have them available or uh, compiled somewhere, then the auditors may not know if you are fully aware of everything you're trying to be training on and protecting against. So I keep mine on my OneNote. I also have it out in my network drive. It's just really easy. I have actually been asked to, to produce this a couple of different times. The second thing you're going to want to do with your compliance is you're going to want to have some learning modules. Now, if you just come into the program and you already have some learning modules, just do what you can, but make sure that your learning modules are hitting the education requirements for your particular industry. 
if you don't have learning modules in place, then my suggestion is, is try and get together a budget and really look and see what's out there. There's some really great software out there that you can purchase. There's some free learning modules out on the, you can use YouTube. But if you're going to do this, you want to do it right, and you want to purchase something that has a really good metrics already in place for you. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of time pulling data and compiling spreadsheets and putting together charts for your executives. Because if you do have a program in place, chances are they're going to want to see the data. So you're going to want to make sure that your learning management system is, it is easily accessible. If it doesn't have an API, which is an application program interface, it's going to be more difficult. So if you are doing compliance, are you done? Is that all that you have to do? Far from it. You are just barely scratching the surface of security awareness if all you're doing is compliance and you're just doing the bare minimum. What you really want to do in order to change the culture at your organization is you're going to want to have a full program where you can start working on that cultural uh, change. So that's where we come to stage three. Now with stage three, this is the, where you're building that rich culture of cybersecurity awareness. And you're, you're gonna want it, this is where you're going to be able to affect that behavior change. So the way you're going to be most successful with this is by tying in with your business objectives that are working for your company, something that one of your executives are, already has working. You want to look at your mission, vision, and values. You want to look at your key performance indicators, your KPIs. And you want to tie in with that. Now, if you have a cutting edge company, you can utilize that to your advantage. But if you have, or if you have a you know, cute and cuddly, smooth, delicate kind of a, a feeling to your company, you're going to want to use that. It's going to be counterintuitive if you try and introduce some other form of a message that doesn't resonate with the employees and staff at your organization. So a couple of things that I have done that I found work really well for sending out my message is I've held events. Events can get uh, the message out uh, concerning your, what the, your regulatory requirements. They should be based on your regu regulatory requirements. But make sure you're, you, you get approval for these first. But there's three different kinds of events that you can actually hold. There is lunch and learns, brown bags, and then finally you can do a security fair. So a lunch and learn is where you have a budget, you invite people, you feed them, and then you teach them about you know, phishing emails or malware, ransomware, whatever it is that you've chosen as the subject for your lunch and learn. And a brown bag is basically the same thing, but you tell them to bring their own lunch. And hopefully, you know, maybe you do one on fraud. Uh, ID theft is a big, big one that usually resonates with a lot of people. And then finally, I find, because I work in healthcare, that I put together a cybersecurity awareness fair is similar to a health fair or a benefits fair. Typically, you need to schedule that as, at a, a specific facility. You have it for an extended period of time. You might have it for four or five hours during the middle of the day. People can come and go as they want, and you have your cyber team there to help um, translate and educate people as they come and go. One great way to get people to attend these ev events is by offering them incentives telling them if they come, they'll be entered in for a prize. You can advertise what the prize is. You can also gamify it, add games, and say, hey, if you, you, can, uh, you can do a CTF, a capture the flag activity. You can say, hey, I need you to, the first 10 people who come to the fair or to my lunch and learn and give me the answers are going to be entered in for this great prize. Um, you can also have great swag. You can advertise that you have swag, and that can get people to come to your events as well. These types of events are really a great tool for you to be able to share your message for a minimal cost, but you're actually able to reach hundreds of people. Like the awareness fairs, we've had hundreds of people turn out for those, and that's a great way to share a message. You have to make sure, though, that you keep your message pretty um, centered on one central theme and not go too far um, out of from what you're trying to teach them. Make sure that they're in alignment with your regulatory requirements. Last year when I did this, I concentrated on that, me uh, that medical ID theft scenario I started out with. And since I work for healthcare, people are telling me that that was a scary scenario. Yeah, it is a scary scenario. But I was told that I needed to change my, my effort. So I, this year, I made it really, 
really fun, really cute, and it, um, last year it was, you know, let's protect patient data, it's, it's important to protect patient data. This year it's be cyber aware, be smarter than the average bear, and watch out for phishing. It works, it, it, it's, it's something people, it's kind of resonating with people, so. Um, so once you've set up your culture and you're starting to build that culture, where do you go from there? Well, there's two more stages that we want to talk about. We're going to talk about those in just a second. Um, the, the next stage is actually your long-term sustainment. So after you've built your culture, and this is long-term sustainment, is where you have a very rich culture of cybersecurity awareness. People are readily emailing you or, or calling the help desk and saying, hey, I think I got a fish, and they're, they're being able to identify that. They know what to look for. Um, you know, if they get a blue screen and the mouse is moving, they know that maybe they've got an infection or they've got malware on their machine. So they're reporting those, and you're not having to pull teeth to get them to understand what those types of things are. And in order to maintain the long-term sustainment for this, you're going to want to continually look at your program every year. You're going to, going to want to review it. You're going to want to make sure that you are still in, within your compliance regulatory requirements and that your, <coughs> your efforts, um, if there's new and emerging threats, that you include those if they pertain to your industry, which, of course, most of them will. And then you also want to start looking at a championship program. And a champion program is where you get people from all across your organization you have them help you with your cybersecurity efforts. You put together a committee, they're on your committee, and you need to make sure that it covers, if you are in a large geographic area, make sure it covers your entire geographic area. You also want to make sure that it um, includes everyone from the grounds, the maintenance people, all the way up to the executive uh, branch of your organization. And on top of that, you need to make sure that you're reviewing your budget and it's alignment with your business objectives. And finally, this is stage five, is where we come to the metrics. Now, you want to have a metrics framework. Now, in order, to, if you're not going to want to st um, do stage five when you're at the end, you've done all the other things, you're going to want to actually start with your human survey. You're going to create a baseline. So when you're creating the baseline, you want, so if you do the lunch and learns or the brown bags or the security awareness fairs, you're going to want to invite people there, but just take a head count. Don't necessarily have to take attendance. It helps because you can just say, oh, I need your name so that I can enter you into the drawing for the prize. Um, it helps, but it's not necessary. You can just do a head count when you do your, your lunch and learns, have someone count heads. Um, and, but then you're going to want to make sure that you're documenting that because the auditors are going to, why are we doing this? Because you've got auditors. Auditors are going to come in and ask you, show me the evidence. Show me what it is that you are doing to protect patient data or to protect the data at your organization. So um, you can do that. There's other things that you can do. So if you have a newsletter, you can set up a newsletter. You can um, count the subscribers to your newsletter. If you have a blog, you can count the subscribers to your blog. One thing that I did this last year was I did podcasts. And the podcasts for me were based off of the Health and Human Services Cybersecurity Task Force imperatives. And we're going to be releasing those next month during Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, you can do how many subscribers or how many listens did you have to your podcast. If you don't have those metrics in place or that the way to pull that data, you should try and see if you can figure it out or if that's something you already have in, within your organization. And if you have the fairs, and I like to do a lot of handouts, you can count how many posters you've post, um, sent out, how many handouts you've sent out. Just keep those on, on hand because I guarantee your auditors are going to ask for that. Um, I just recently went through a HIPAA audit. I can vouch that this program does work. I've been following this program for the last year, and I just passed my HIPAA audit. They said, we don't have anything to recommend. You're doing it. You're doing everything you need to do. So I felt really good about that. So we've got the five stages again. Where do we go? If, if, if you are just like the IT guy at your organization, you're the security person, and you might be both the IT guy and the security person, are you going to be able to do this? Not without help. And that's where you can utilize Sands and Gartner's awareness report. You can go to your executives and say, hey, I need some help. In order to really affect change at, at our organization, you're going to need to invest in some FTEs or some full-time employees to help me. 
As they state that you need 1.9 full-time employees to manage an awareness program that effectively changes behavior at the organizational level, and you need 3.9 FTEs in, or in order to be able to do this and um, have a full metrics in place as well. So what you can do, and I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but a great way to get your executives involved is just go out and find some breaches in your industry Show them how much those breaches are going to cost versus, you know, hiring one or two people to help you in your security awareness efforts. Now, I do have a couple of pointers and tips if you don't think this is going to be successful at your organization because you have a really small company, you don't have a big budget, and that is that there's some things that are already in place that you can utilize. Some of the things that are already in place that you can utilize are next month is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So the whole month of October, is a great time for you to do either a week or one day where you can focus and concentrate your efforts. There's a lot of free resources out on the internet. All you're gonna have to do is pay for printing, and maybe it's a couple of reams of paper. Um, you can, there's free posters, there's free information on how to spot a fish, so you don't have to really put in a lot of time and effort into this. The other thing, there's also some free videos. There's YouTube, they've got some great resources for you. Stop thinking it actually has videos that you can download for free and, and they've ev all of these that I have up here they've said go ahead and use our stuff just don't change anything SANS has a uh, newsletter that you're able to use and I, I don't know if you noticed but down here on the corner I've got AARP so does ever anyone know who Fra Frank Abagnale is he's the guy from catch me if you can he works for the FBI he put together an amazing ID theft handout free of charge. He also has a quiz as well as some videos on that website. So yeah, AARP, great resource for cybersecurity. Um, the other, oh, so one other thing you can do is you can, you know, look at your organization and see if there's a project manager who would be willing to help you. And so you can maybe pull some people together, put together a project, present it to your executives, and maybe they'll throw together some money and help you be successful in doing like maybe a one-day awareness effort. So, final thoughts. If you plan to fit, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. And a goal without a plan is just a wish. And my favorite is if you don't know where you're going, you're probably going to end up somewhere else. So, I'm just going to open up for Q&A. So, I, I have um, a couple of questions for you. Who has done, who has seen some successes in their cybersecurity program? Does anyone want to share successes down here in the front? What have you done? You use the So he said that he uses no before and they have a really good phishing platform. Are you using the fish me button? Is, is that the one that has the button that's in the email and you can click on it if they see a fish? Yeah, kind of like that. Yeah, sort of. Uh, he's also saying that they have some great metrics. They do have some great metrics. I was trying to keep this vendor agnostic, but my personal one of my personal favorites for the metrics is actually Wombat. Wombat has tiered phishing emails that you can create, um, and they have really great metrics. It's very granular. It's a, it, it, and so there's some some things that you can use right there. Does anybody want to share something? Yes, back back there, the gentleman with the blue shirt. So now, now you're enrolled in the learning manage, in the learning a module, and congratulations to you, right? <laughs> I love that. I think that's a, an amazing tool, and hopefully, eventually, we're going to get to that point to where if somebody actually clicks on a phishing simulation, they automatically get enrolled in the learn in the learning. I also like to um, I'd like to be able to do targeted training for those individuals who are continually clicking on the link, no matter what you do. They're the housekeeper is doing their shopping in their email, and they, you know, they do, they think they did win a prize, or someone's going to give them a million dollars if they share their bank account information with them. So I love that. Anything else? Any what over here?
That's a wonderful idea. He said that he had uh, extra TVs on hand, and um, he utilized those as a um, gamification. Gamification is wonderful. Um, I have a really large organization. I've only been doing this for a short while, so I haven't actually utilized any IT type functions. We we did do a, a Jeopardy game for a while um, before I took over the program, and some things that I that work for me because we have individuals who are all the way from millennial just entering the workforce all the way to retirees. So a couple of really simple things that I've done is I put together a crossword puzzle. I included the words on the crossword puzzle. You had to kind of look for them. But then I said, hey, bring this over, and you're entered in for a prize. I've also used um, word search. So you have to be careful with word search that you fully um, review your word search and make sure there's no, nothing naughty in there. Because <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that can get you. Um, anything else anybody would like to share? Well, thank you so much for your time. Appreciate you taking a moment to listen to me. Oh, one more comment. Yeah. So, as I indicated before, I, um, our learning management system is in the process of being reviewed by our company. Um, I have somebody pull that data for me because I don't have access to pull it myself, um, and it's on a pass-fail rate. And then I take that, and I've created a spreadsheet. I've had... Um, my teammate John over here, he helped me put together some V lookup to where we can actually pull the data and we've thrown it into a, a chart so I can present that to my CIO, my chief information officer, uh, or my chief security officer and say, hey, this is how everyone's doing on their pass fail rate. The other thing that I did um, was I, I tracked every single piece of swag that I passed out at every single security fair I went to. I tracked how many newsletters that I sent out. I've tracked how many pieces of swag that I gave and how many people have um, come to my fairs. Those are the things that I've used for my metrics. And so last year we visited several facilities and when we visit them again, I will be able to use the attendance. So I had attendance last year at one of our facilities. I had about 150 last year. This year we had about 100 more. So I'm going to take the per, the, that percentage and compare it to how many people actually work at that facility, and that can sh um, that's going to show the increase year over year of the um, how engaged people are. So, anything else? Okay, thanks everybody.